Some things to celebrate or more hardship ahead. After months of protests and tough debt negotiations, the Sri Lankan government has secured a near $3 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund. But can it bail the country out from its worst economic crisis since independence? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nick Clark. So, years of economic mismanagement and the impact of the pandemic have pushed Sri Lanka into its worst financial crisis since 1948. And that's led to months of protests, forcing the president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, to flee the country last July. On Tuesday, Sri Lankans woke up to news that gives some hope a near $3 billion bailout from the major financial agency of the United Nations, the IMF. But the bankrupt nation is expected to face tough changes. Let's take a closer look at the IMF deal. Well, the first instalment of the loan of more than $300 million is to be handed out immediately. The deal will open the door to another $4 billion of funding and investment. But President Ranil Wickremesinghe's government has to carry out tax reforms, rein in corruption and design greater social safety nets for the poor. The bailout program will last for four years. In an address to the nation, the president welcomed the deal as a significant step for its future. Sri Lanka is no longer a bankrupt nation. Therefore, we can restart normal transactions. As our foreign exchange situation improves, we'll gradually roll back import restrictions. Essential goods, medicine and things needed for tourism will be our priority. Well, let's hear now from Manel Fernandez, who's in Colombo, and her people's reactions to the deal. A few months ago, fuel stations like this were a hive of activity as people scrambled for fuel amid shortages, with the government unable to supply the demand. But today things are a little bit quieter, but for a limited period as the government scrambles to get enough money to buy essential services. And that's where the IMF loan comes in. A perfectly good time as people say they are really struggling. There's no medicine. Uh, they say they are really, really burdened with high taxes, a high cost of living. The future of the country is secured to a certain extent. The people will, won't be able to suffer the way that they suffered for the last few months or last one year. Good we got it. It must be spent to solve the country's problems. If they steal that too, then we will lose again. If they reduce the price of fuel and food items and give people some relief, then it's good. I'm happy that we got the loan because the people in the country are living in very difficult times. We hope there will be a reawakening. With the cost of fuel, electricity, other utilities, energy, food, all skyrocketing three to five fold, people say they're really, really struggling to make ends meet. What they say is they're happy with the IMF package, uh, that it might give them some respite. But what they do say is that if uh, these funds are stolen, like they've seen done many, many times in the past, that it's going to be the same old situation. And for the people of this country, that is something that they just cannot deal with or just even face the prospect of. Minel Fernandez, Inside Story. All right, let's take this on for more on this. Joined by our guests in Colombo, Eran Wickrama Ratne, who's a member of uh, Sri Lanka's parliament and a former state minister of finance. In Mumbai, we have Aganeshan Vignaraja, policy advisor and senior research associate for the Overseas Development Institute. And in Colombo, Ahelan Kadildama, political economist and chairman of the Cooperative Development Bank. Warm welcome to all of you. And Ganeshan, I'd like to start with you first, if I may. Sri Lanka, as we've been hearing, has seen some very dark economic days in recent months. It's still going through them, indeed. Is this going to pull the nation back from the brink? So this is the most uh, significant program that Sri Lanka has had in its history. And it will give some new money, not so much, maybe 720 million a year, 
but it could help to restore some market confidence and allow the country to begin to come out of this crisis. But this is only a start. There's a lot of hard work ahead. Uh, we have to complete debt restructuring. We have to ensure that we put in place pro-growth reforms, including a green economy. And we have to ensure political consensus across the aisle so that there is buy-in for this program for the full four, five-year term. You say it could help to restore some market confidence. Does really sound like a, a ringing endorsement, Ganesha. Well, the debt burden is quite large. I mean, there's $58 billion or so outstanding. And uh, I think the markets will be watching Sri Lanka to see that it actually credibly implements some of these difficult choices. So the tax rises are one. Uh, secondly, there is some expenditure control expected. A central bank bill has to be passed to make the central bank much more independent. And there is an anti-corruption bill. Uh, so it's quite a tall order that has to be done, and hence this need for a political consensus across the aisle, uh, which will be quite a task ask. Helen, what do you think? Significant moment, tall order? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be, um, continue to be very hard on the people, and, and, and that's what I'm most concerned about. The, while the IMF agreement uh, was approved by the executive board today, over the last year, Sri Lanka has been uh, continuing to implement the IMF's recommendations, a massive interest rate hikes, where the central bank's policy rate is 16.5%, which means that lending to small businesses on the order of 30%. Even rural folk who want to pawn their jewelry now have to uh, get it at 25 to 30%. Um, the cost of living has been extremely high because of the depreciation of the rupee, and all of that has been passed on to, to the people. These austerity measures have led to um, people in the non-formal uh, sector, their incomes have been halved. Now, this agreement is just going to continue on that path of austerity. This is unsustainable from the point of view of the working people of Sri Lanka, even though it might give some market confidence it might give some confidence to the creditors. In terms of the ordinary people, there is very little in this to lift them from this deep economic depression from which they are suffering. Erin, let, let me just bring in Erin uh, Wickrama Ratne. You're an opposition MP, sir. Uh, what's your view of this? Is this, uh, as we've just heard from Ahalan, keeping Sri Lanka on the road to austerity, or is it some kind of does it provide some kind of hope, some kind of resolution to the crisis? Uh, we say this uh, IMF arrangement as uh, necessary, uh, but it is not the solution. It is a necessary uh, step uh, in a larger solution that is needed. Uh, we have been saying for quite some time that uh, the government should have gone to the International Monetary Fund, we've been saying it's for two years, uh, because it sends a signal that the government is serious about fiscal consolidation. It's serious about fiscal discipline. Uh, and and it, it is a good signal to both the debt markets as well as to investors. So the amounts that the IMF are giving are not very great, but it's the issue of the signal. Now, because they have delayed it for so long, uh, you know, some of the reforms that have to be done are going to be very painful. And uh, one thing that we have said from the beginning is that when we bring in reforms, it affects certain parts of society, the poor, the vulnerable, the working classes, and certainly small and medium industries more than others. And therefore, there has to be some countermeasures to make sure that we socially protect those who are vulnerable. So, Ganeshan, that's the thing, isn't it? It's going to be incredibly painful for many people. There's only more economic pain ahead. And the, the government's already doubled taxes. It's increased energy tariffs. Uh, and it's slashed subsidies. So where is there hope from this for the ordinary person on the street? 
So one interesting factor with the interest rates being hiked is that inflation is slowly beginning to come down to its lowest level. It's still at 50 odd percent, which is very high. But according to the projections that I have seen, uh, next year and the year after, it could come down to some 20 odd percent and below that. And that, what that means is that food prices uh, will slowly begin to come down, particularly if we are lucky and get uh, good uh, rains, uh, which means agricultural productivity could also rise. And, but you're uh, talking the right months ahead, are you? Chemical fertilizers apply. Uh, I'm sorry. You're talking about months ahead, are you? Yes. No. It will take some time. There will mm. be a transition. So one of the things uh, that was done last year was a World Bank cash transfer program, which gave some relief, uh, five to seven thousand rupees for a few months. And I think uh, we have to have a, a massive cash transfer program uh, alongside this IMF program. I understand that the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank will provide budget support, and one hopes that government will use this budget support for a massive cash transfer program for the poor, so that the poorest are looked after uh, while we have this transition. Uh, clearly, there will be austerity uh, in this first round of measures, but with inflation hopefully coming down and with cash transfers, there will be more uh, some relief coming through. And then ultimately, there has to be growth. And I guess that will take a couple of years before we see a turnaround from negative growth of 8% uh, in 2022 uh, to minus probably 3 to 4% this year, uh, and hopefully positive growth in 2024, 2025. And so there will no doubt be a, a difficult period ahead, but it's the start of a process of getting us out of this crippling economic crisis. Of course, we can talk about growth and GDP and imports and exports all we like, but the bottom line is for the ordinary man and woman on the street is the availability of essential items, the ability to, to feed themselves and their families. Ahalan, is this going to make a difference? Will there be an immediate change uh, to the availability of those essential items? No, um, obviously not. Um, as, as mentioned, you know, that there is negative 8% GDP growth. You know, and that is on the order of the Great Depression of the 1930s, if you take a small country like Sri Lanka for us. And the last quarter of 2022, it was negative 12.6% GDP growth. So basically, people have lost their jobs, their livelihoods are in uh, disarray. If you take small farmers or small fisher folk, they use kerosene oil as their fuel, and the price of kerosene is four times what it was a year ago. The entire IMF push is to bring down inflation but inflation in the case of Sri Lanka was a one-time hike because of the depreciation of the rupee from 200 rupees to a dollar to 360, and the price hikes globally in, due to the war in Ukraine. Obviously, inflation is calculated year on year, so after a year, the inflation is going to come down. But raising interest rates to the level where even the World Bank says 500,000 jobs have been lost in Sri Lanka. But that path is continuing. The social protection provided in the IMF agreement amounts to a meager 0.6% of GDP, just 180 billion rupees. Mm -hmm. So there is going to be political opposition. And even if the opposition in parliament does not take this up, people are probably going to go out on the streets because they just can't deal with life like this. OK, I was going to come on to that, but let's, let's put it to the opposition in, in parliament. Erin, you're an MP. What do you say to that? Yes, so there are two uh, sides to this, uh, and one side is the macroeconomy and how it affects the who are vulnerable. So uh, you have to have fiscal consolidation, and therefore revenues have to go up. Uh, our dispute with the government has been is that whom do you take this revenue from? That's really been the issue, not that revenues shouldn't be taken. Revenues have to go up. Uh, and uh, we have been arguing, like even for the uh, working class, you know, the tax-free slabs, uh, right, have been halved. They should be actually increased. And there are other ways in which the revenues can be actually taken. Uh, we've been championing those causes, but uh, uh, we haven't had much success uh, with the government on that. So I think how this affects. Uh, the poor, the vulnerable, and the working class is really the issue. 
And, it and is an issue, and that's, that's exactly what uh, the point that Harlan was making. I, I think is is the the potential for protests on the street because if we keep on this road to austerity, we saw those protests last year. They're only going to come back in, in even greater numbers, aren't they? Yeah. So, so the the, the social protection right uh, it really needs to be speeded up. And uh, the government used to have a program. It's a highly politicized program. People have lost confidence in it. And uh, now the World Bank and the ADB and the others are going to come along. Uh, but we want to say, even to these international organizations, right, going down the same road won't help. Uh, the social protection should be on a scientific basis because the methodology that is even being used now is unacceptable. They're okay, using Can a I, just, I just want to jump in there just for a second. I'm, I, do, I do apologize for jumping in, but could you just explain for us what you mean by social protections? Yeah, so for example, if you are making a social transfer to people, right, and we, we believe in social transfer rather than just in price manipulation. For example, if you have an international liter of oil, uh, uh, you know, let, let's say at 400 rupees, right, giving that at 200 rupees doesn't solve the problem because anyway, the poor won't use it. It'll be mostly the benefit will go to those who are actually have incomes. Therefore, you need to have direct transfers to the poor. Mm. And then the question comes in is, how do you actually select the poor? And to select the poor, you need to employ scientific methods of actually selecting the poor, rather than, you know, <clears throat> you know, people going around and trying to figure out where they live, whom they have voted for, what are their assets, and this kind of thing. This has happened in the past, and I can see a repetition of the same thing. That's what we mean. In scientific, I mean hereby use other indicators, like consumption, maybe electricity consumption, like some university professors have pointed okay. out, which shows you if they consume below 30 kilowatt hours or 60 kilowatt hours, that means they don't have a refrigerator or they're very poor. And that's a more scientific basics. So social protection actually needs us to be speeded up and we need to make sure that those transfers are actually going to the poor. Because if they are not, reforms will not be able to go through because there will be social unrest. Exactly. And so what's your view on that, Ganeshan? People have been through a lot as it is. If, if these reforms don't happen, if, if the people don't see any result in the shape of food on their table, uh, how quickly might it change the mood on the streets, do you think? It, it's possible that there will be uh, some unrest down the line. Uh, there have been uh, some protests, but those are probably from a very activist community. Um, and indeed, you know, there is no question that the cash transfers uh, that one was talking about have to be accelerated very rapidly. And this new money, particularly from the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank, I hope will be largely spent on cash transfers rather than unproductive jobs necessarily in the public sector. Uh, may I make a correction of one of the points about the inflation? Um, cut, uh, raising interest rates has had a large impact on bringing down inflation over time, um, as well as will the central bank bill. Uh, if it gets passed, because they will take the central bank out of financing the government budget deficit, which is a very important thing, because the central bank in the past was used as a political football by uh, certain uh, political authorities and, and used to finance unsustainable government expenditure. So these two important measures will help. So inflation has to come down, uh, but with that cash transfers. And then I think we have to attempt to open the import regime to cheaper food imports. Um, when uh, reserves have somewhat come, and hopefully again, uh, the donor funding can be used to fund cheaper food to come in, uh, because that's one of the other ways we can uh, make the living standards much more bearable for people um, as, we, as we go down the road. All right, let's talk about this big block of money that, that we've got coming in, $3 billion nearly. Uh, where does the first tranche of money, it's $300 million, where, where does that first tranche of money uh, need to go, Ahalan? The, the, the first tranche is expected in the next couple uh, days or within the week, uh, 300 million, 330 million US dollars. It's going to be for budgetary support. The, all the IMF funds are going to be used for budgetary support over the next four years. But when you actually look at the amount, 3 billion US dollars from the IMF, 3.75 billion US dollars from the international financial institutions like the World Bank and ADB over four years. That's really very little when you look at, for example, Sri Lanka's debt stock or even our import bill. So that's um, 
approximately 7 billion US dollars over four years, so only 1.7 billion US dollars a year. But our import bill is something on the order of 15 billion US dollars every year. So this is not going to make such a difference in terms of us being able to import our essential goods. They are mainly doing it through our foreign earnings, through our exports, our remittances, and to a much lesser extent now through tourism. But the, the big picture is that when you take an economy like Sri Lanka, about 60 to 70% of our workforce is in the informal sector. They don't get a regular monthly salary. So when you talk about targeting and providing support, you know, one day a fisherman does not have an income, the next day a farmer does not, you need something like a universal scheme. And that's what Sri Lanka had. Sri Lanka is known for its free education, its free healthcare, and until the 1970s, we had a food subsidy which ensured that we had much higher human development indicators. Now, what the IMF and the World Bank are trying to do is what they've done all around the world is to narrow that claiming that they're going to target. And are they going to target all 70% of the population? No, they're going to target, they're going to leave a lot of people out. And, and, and that's a major concern, that this will be really regressive in terms of the social welfare um, progress that Sri Lanka has made in its post-colonial history. If you look at what's happened to food prices, last year it went up by 90%, but nobody's incomes went up. So there's mm. effectively real wages have dropped by 40%. And if right. you take okay, let, wage, let me move it on a little bit. Was, we're just running out of time. Sorry to jump in, but we're just running out of time. And uh, Erin, I want to come to you. Uh, because there is this overriding issue of debt, and the deal is designed to restructure what is it, $95 billion worth of public debt. That restructuring is yet to be finalized. A great deal of the debt uh, is owed to China and their concessions to make this deal happen have fallen short of what the IMF expect. Should China go easier on Sri Lanka? Uh, there is no question that uh, every partner should be on, you know, uh, on the same basis. So China, India, Japan, and the Paris Club should be on the same basis. So we have to really talk to our friends and we have to say that. And in the debt restructuring, my word of caution would be is we need to be careful that we don't tamper with basically domestic debt. Uh, we don't have a banking crisis and we mustn't create a banking crisis. And I think that needs to be clear to everybody, otherwise it will be self-defeating. I think one of the big issues the government faces is actually this is a government without a mandate and, and how are they actually going to push through the reforms. Uh, therefore, they have to do things that will build confidence. You know, they should, uh, the lower hanging fruits will be is like dealing with corruption. The IMF has mentioned it, but we really haven't seen much action there. Build confidence. Ultimately, for Sri Lanka to get out of this, it's not going to be the IMF deal. We ultimately will have to attract investors to come here and therefore confidence building is going to be very important. We have to get the economy growing because the economy is shrinking at the moment. And then we will have to basically make sure that exports takes precedence over everything else. Because if exports take precedence and the dollars keep coming in, uh, then I can see that the you know, uh, employment uh, opportunities will also grow. So social protection is short term, but actually the economy needs to grow and confidence building and a government having a mandate will be absolutely right. critical. Uh, Ganeshan, uh, Erin just mentioning corruption there, it is one of the chief conditions of the loan that corruption is, uh, is tackled rapidly to try and root out the deep-seated deep graph that there is. Are you confident that this, the corruption can be beaten? I think we will need a new corruption bill and strong international scrutiny of our procurement, for instance. Uh, some of the Belt and Road projects that China gave us uh, were low return uh, and uh, politically directed, such as the famous Hambantota port and the Maptala airport. And I think, you know, those kinds of projects are unaffordable for, for a country like Sri Lanka. So we have to have a much better basis for how we fund our infrastructure. Another very important aspect is how political parties are funded in Sri Lanka and how campaign finance works. I think that's going to be another very important area uh, to be looked at. And ultimately, I think this economy has to go from a socialist-styled, welfare-oriented economy to a much more market-oriented growth economy uh, in order to generate the revenue that we need 
uh, to fund the kind of social protection and welfare that we need without donors and without an IMF program. And it's my wish that Sri Lanka does not have to go to the IMF again in my professional lifetime. And that really means that we have to make these reforms work beyond the IMF. Uh, we need to have a comprehensive program of structural reforms uh, to make the economy much more open to trade, to green the economy. We have to have this green transition and we have to make the economy also much more inclusive. And that means the small and medium enterprise and the informal sector have to be made much more productive. At the moment, their productivity is very, very low and the skill base is very, very low. So in a small country like ours, I think all these things are possible if we have political consensus on taking these things forward and creating a wealthy economy for the next generation of Sri Lankans. OK, uh, Harlan, if I can come to you, uh, isn't that the thing that economy, the sectors of the economy need to be developed further and there is no state-led grand plan to do that. There's no specific area where, where things are being focused. That's true. And, and I think part of the reason is, as Aaron mentioned, there is no legitimate political leadership in the country. When a country goes through an economic depression, you need a legitimate and a, a leadership that can lead the country. We have a president who was elected by parliament, not even elected by the people. So first, we need a political leadership. And in terms of the focus, I would say the focus should be on agriculture and the food system. Because Sri Lanka is in grave danger of even a famine if you're not careful. The economy is collapsing. Families in rural areas are eating one or two meals a day. And finally, you know, we have to reckon with how we came to this crisis. The elite of this country gained much. If you look at Colombo, over the last 10 years, the luxury cars, the buildings, the elite have paid, and we need something like a wealth tax so that the elite pay back all that they extracted over the last two decades. And on the other hand, the bondholders, everybody's talking about Chinese debt, but the majority of our debt is bondholders and vulture funds who've really extracted from Sri Lanka, and there should be a large capital levy or a haircut on such debt. And that's the only way that you know, we can redistribute so that the people of the country who have built this country uh, are given some respite and money. Okay. Well, the uh, delayed local elections coming up soon in April, they perhaps will offer a glimpse into Sri Lanka's political climate and how people uh, respond to all of this. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thanks very much indeed. Eren Wickramaratne, Ganesh Vignaraja, and Ahalan Kadil Gama. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again at any time by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.